We awoke to the sound of the death of the world. From that moment on, not a thing could be heard. The sea arose quickly and swallowed the town. On its 100th anniversary in 2016, people came to commemorate the Battle of Jutland. It was the largest naval battle of the First World War. It involved 250 ships and 100,000 men. It lasted 36 hours and confirmed Britain's naval dominance. While this battle dominates history books, closer to home, the fishermen of the ports of Grimsby and Hull had pretty much given up their livelihoods to help with the war effort, with the dangerous task of minesweeping. It began in 1907, when Admiral Lord Charles Beresford, the Commander-in-Chief of the Home Fleet, visited Grimsby. While in the port, he recognised the potential of using trawling gear for mine clearance work. It was enough to impress him. Writing at the time, he also recognised the skills of the fishermen. Our fishing fleets in war will be rendered inactive and will in consequence be available for war service. Fishermen, by virtue of their calling, are adept in the handling and towing of wires and trawls, more so than our naval ratings. Small naval vessels, if used in minesweeping, will be used at the expense of other urgent war requirements. Why was it a crucial role? Well, because, of course, early in the 20th century, they were developing the, uh, the Dreadnought, which was a state-of-the-art battleship, steam turbine engines, latest technology in every sense, said to render every other vessel in the world uh, obsolete, certainly every other battleship. But in actual fact, technology was changing in other ways. We'd already in the 19th century seen the development of the torpedo. Uh, in, in the 20th century, the early part of the 20th century, in the war between the Russians and the Japanese, the sea mine had come into its own. This explosive device that you could lay in the sea and could blow up ships. Britain is an island, trades with the rest of the world. So what you would literally seek to do was to destroy its fleet of merchant ships and presumably also its fleet of Royal Navy ships by the use of mines. So Beresford, like a number of um, naval officers, was keen on finding a way of removing the mines. What happened was, of course, on a tour of East Coast ports, he came to Grimsby. He fell into conversation, into discussions with George Low Allwood. Now, George Allwood was one of the leading lights of the fishing industry. And he discussed with Beresford the idea that trawlers and trawlermen would be a suitable way of, of uh, dealing with mines. In the 1900s, a tenth of the fish consumed in the country was landed at Grimsby. In 1913, 1.21 million tonnes of fish were landed overall in the UK. Trawlers used a beam trawl, which consisted of a triangular flat purse-shaped net, often more than 100 feet in length, that was towed through the water. Flat skids on the bottoms of the trawl heads allowed the net to skim over the seabed. Trawling proved an admirable way for taking uh, fish, the sort of fish that could be sold cheaply and in large amounts in land. And trawlers um, and, and trawler crews spread and explored the whole of the North Sea. Hull and Grimsby grew to be the great ports out of this. And it's really dramatic when you look at it, because go back to 1840, and if you look in the ship registers, there are no more than a dozen fishing vessels working out of the Humber, and most of them are shrimpers. You go through to 1880, and Hull and Grimsby have got, between them, a combined fleet of over a 1,000 sailing vessels, and they are, with Yarmouth, the largest fishing ports in the world. Go on another 20 years, and all those Sailing vessels have gone from Hull and Grimsby, their steam, steam fleets. You know, this was a dynamic period for Hull and Grimsby. Lots of money were made, was made, and a, a, a lot of new industry and innovation took place. The Humber ports recognised steam fishing boats were the future at the end of the 18th century. By 1901, some 471 trawlers were sailing out of Grimsby. As firms began to set up using these new boats, 
distant water fishing around Iceland and the White Sea increased. Steam changed all sorts of things. First of all, you got the development of the, the, the iron and then later steel hulled ship with a steam engine. Uh, they really took off uh, steam for fishing in the days of what we call the triple expansion steam engine. Don't want really to go into the technicalities, but basically it was an extremely powerful engine given the size of the engine itself. So it was ideal for fishing. You got the development of that, and they were much more efficient than the old sailing smacks for all sorts of reasons. They could pull a bigger trawl, but they could work in weather that either becalmed or was too rough for the sailing smacks. They were estimated to be four times as efficient as, as an individual sailing smack. But of course, they were much more expensive, and it led to the creation in the 1890s of a large number of joint stock limited liability steam trawling companies at places like Hull and Grimsby. Uh, and that completely altered the nature of the fishing industry as well. So you've got owners. Henceforward, most, most um, people who pass through the ranks as fishermen could only really expect to reach the status of being a skipper. Prior to that, people had looked to becoming trawler others themselves, perhaps getting to be a skipper, buying a sailing smack, and then perhaps buying another one and perhaps even another one. But in future, it was largely going into be hand, in the hands of the Joint Stock Limited Liability steam trawling companies. There were one or two uh, smaller fishermen around, still owning their own vessels uh, out of places like Hull and Grimsby, but most of the fleet was in big hands. Around 12,000 men worked on boats within the Humber ports, with more employed in the services attached to the industry. In 1908, Grimsby trawler owner George Lowe Ulwood gave two of his vessels to the Admiralty. Ulwood had built the first steam trawlers in the town and was a well-respected man. It's really very difficult to underestimate the importance of the Ulwood brothers, George Lowe Ulwood in particular, in, in terms of their role in the development of the fishing industry. Uh, they'd come up with their father from the south coast. He was the first working fisherman. Uh, James and George had both gone to sea uh, and, and become trawler skippers in their own right at quite a young age. And then they moved into management. They were involved in all the innovations that took place, the development of the steam trawler, the development of the trawling winch, um, the, and, and even in, in, in techniques and, and importance of trying to conserve fish stocks. It's difficult to underestimate the role that they played, and particularly in the case of George Allwood, who lived such a long life, he lived into his 90s, he was involved and interested in so many different dimensions of the industry itself. He really was a credit to Grimsby. GY5 Anders and GY6 Algoma were taken to Portland, where mine sweeping tests were carried out. In sweeping for mines, the towing warp did the work of the sweeping wire. There was a kite and a chute, as well as hundreds of fathoms of wire. The mine either promptly exploded or was detonated by gunfire from a destroyer or an armed trawler, or by sharpshooters with rifles. There were, there were glitches, as you can imagine, but they became gradually more efficient at doing it. And the whole thing about mine sweeping was, of course, it was a dangerous job. Because, of course, to clear the mines, you have to actually enter the mine field, uh, which is quite something. Uh, and, and, of course, when you are clearing the mines, what you're basically doing is you have a couple of trawlers going along, in basic terms, towing this cable or wire between them uh, and the idea is that that will foul the cables that hold the mine to the seabed, cut through them, the mines will pop up to the surface and you dispose of them by gunfire. By gun, you dispose of them by gunfire. That's the theory. In, in practice, of course, it's more complicated than that. Uh, sometimes the mines fouled your, um, your, 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 the gear and, and you pulled them up onto the side of the ship. Sometimes you didn't see the mine and it might well explode. It was an incredibly dangerous job and although they got very efficient at it, they reckoned that on average throughout the war, one mine sweeper was lost every other week. The Navy declared the trawlers would be indispensable and between 1909 and 1914 began to purchase their own. The port of Grimsby became the Humber Minesweeping Division base, known as HM Pekin, with Captain Massey Dawson, RN, as the mobilising officer. The Royal Naval Reserve Trawler Section was formed in 1910. 
Right. First of all, if you ask me what did fishermen do, what did the fishing industry do in the Great War, there are several different dimensions to this. First of all, um, a large number of vessels were taken up for mine sweeping, an enormous number that we look at. Other vessels were taken up and put onto anti-submarine patrol and similar work like that. The, the Viola is a good example of that, that type of craft. Uh, and others remained fishing. And, of course, to remain fishing was extremely important because you also had to try to maintain the beleaguered nation's fish supply. Those vessels in Admiralty service served around the world as well as the British Isles. We were swallowed up home by the beast of the sea And woke again under the sycamore tree On the 24th of August 1914, restrictions were put in place forbidding fishing in the North Sea to the east of a line drawn from the Hook of Holland to Sundberg Head and to the south of the latitude of Lowestoft. It was intended to keep fishing vessels clear of the minefields. However, the first fishing casualties of the war came in September 1914. The Grimsby steam trawler, Fitonia. Fitonia had been out in the North Sea fishing. I don't remember exactly, but I think it may have been in the Iceland area. And the guy was just coming back with a very big load of fish. And the weather was very bad, and it was delayed by the bad weather. And they were getting very close. It was about 27 miles off the Donnanook when they hit the mine. Well, I can't remember exactly when it was, but I remember my mother telling me that her, her granddad had been killed when his ship hit a mine off the Humber. And she also told me that my great aunt Fan, who was one of Harry Condor's daughters, she'd seen a model of the Fitonia in what was then the Doughty Museum in Grimsby. And it's a, um, you call it, it's a half wooden model, about two foot six long. And it's now in the Fishing Heritage Centre. It's not on display normally, but it's in the Fishing Heritage Centre. Well, all I know is, it's, first of all, it's difficult to find fishermen in the censuses because they're not always, either, they weren't, in, weren't co didn't answer the appropriate questionnaires or they, they just don't see the end up in the censuses. But also, the in, they've got very good indexes at the fishing, the archives in Grimsby, but they're only fully indexed from 19, about 1911. So you only know the top about three, three positions in each ship from the dates the record starts, which is about the 1880s, until 1911. He was just this sort of memory in the family, but clearly he was a young man when he came over to Grimsby, worked his way through the ranks until he became a skipper, and it was a really sad end. And my concern has always been around my great-grandmother and how did she manage to rear five children in 1914 without the support of a husband. So um, it's been an issue within the family, but one that has gained momentum more recently with the research that's going on with the, uh, the group that are looking at the uh, vessels in the Humber that were sunk. A few days later, on September the 6th, Hull's finest steam trawler, Imperialist, was lost along with her skipper, Joe Wood, and deckhand Thomas Jackson. Built at Beverly in 1911 and owned by the Imperial Sea Fishing Company, the Imperialist was on her way back from a successful fishing trip when disaster struck. One of the survivors told the probate court there was an explosion. Most likely she'd struck a mine. The mate, Jay Gibbs, was picked up and the Rhodesia picked up the remaining 10 crew members. In about 1915, early on, um, there were about nine, seven or eight or nine uh, hull trawlers sunk and a submarine was just crop up, you know, surface and um, threatened to sink them and the men were ordered into a rowing boat or some were taken prisoner. And um, so the civilians would know this, you know, back home in Hesel Road and Freeman Street or wherever, around the Humber, and uh, they would really be frightened by it all. Like I say, there's, I don't think there's any other um, workforce civilians that was so cheek by jowl fighting with the Germans like the, the fishermen. R.W. Kemp, skipper of the Grimsby boat Lobelia, 
spent 16 months as a prisoner of war in 1914 at the outbreak of hostilities. In an extract from an interview he gave in 1918, he spoke of the humiliation the crew had suffered when captured and taken to Wilhelmshaven. It was three o'clock in the afternoon and we were hauling and we had got out the otter boards and up to the gallows and should have had the cod end of the net unlashed when we saw all at once about 10 torpedo boats and three cruisers and soon as they opened to sight we knew that they were bloody Germans. Another Grimsby fisherman who had sailed for the Letton brothers suffered such terrible injuries that he was left a different man. He'd been hit on the back of the head with a rifle butt for picking up a half-smoked cigarette. He spent his time in hospital having several pieces of skull removed. Jay Blackmore, skipper of the Zenobia from Grimsby, was bitten by a German guard dog and complained. His punishment? To be tied to a tree for two hours a day for four days. These prisoner war camps in Germany, I think about three or four, uh, there were, uh, I mean initially, um, I've been told by the people at Carnegie uh, Research Centre in Hull uh, that they were taken uh, there and the families didn't know. You know, there's a mystery, you know, whether they've been sunk or lost or, or what had happened to them. And so that would cause a lot of uh, fear amongst the families as to what had happened to them. But, but there were, you know, in these prisoner of war camps as civilians and quite badly treated. And, uh, you know, the, uh, the, I believe that there were suddenly, this, or after a month of uncertainty or weeks of uncertainty, uh, they would get letters asking, maybe through the Red Cross, uh, asking for clothing as maybe the German winter set in. And um, so they were there for a long, you know, many years. And, uh, but they were classed as prisoners of war, but just, uh, they were civilians, like I was saying before. Um, and there was the casualties of war, I'm afraid, you know. Herbert Johnson was uh, a hull trollerman. Um, he, he worked in the Hellier fleets, boxing fleets, in the North Sea before the First World War. Uh, and come the First World War, he remained as a fisherman for a couple of years. Uh, and as a fisherman, um, he worked out in the North Sea. Uh, they were given areas by the Admiralty where they could fish and where they couldn't fish, and he, like many of them, ignored these, continued to fish where he wanted to fish for large portions of the time. But of course he was eventually caught by the Germans. His vessel was sunk, uh, he, he, he suffered this particular fate of uh, having to row across um, to, in his rowing boat to the uh, to the U-boat, standing around on the deck while they blew it up, and then having been left in the middle of the North Sea in a rowing boat with the rest of the crew, but luckily was picked up by a Grimsby vessel and brought back in. A few weeks later, on another ship, this time voyaging to back from Iceland, he was caught and sunk in a very similar fashion by another German U-boat. So he had two experiences that. After that, he joined the Royal Naval Reserve. And, and, and spent a lot of the time in, in the Mediterranean on the, what we call the Taranto blockade. On the 18th of May 1915, Hull trawlers Duke of Wellington and Euclid were captured by a torpedo boat while fishing on the Dogger Bank. The Hull Daily Mail reported it as a curious incident. The skipper of a Grimsby boat had come upon a boat marked Euclid Hull. In the boat were sorts of clothes life belts, a keg of water, some provisions and a basket of fish. The road wharf, together with a brass fender, which had been slashed by some sharp instrument. Skipper Wright states the indication pointed to the boat's occupants having had to leave the craft in a hurry. There was, yeah, well there was, because, you know, the fear. And, uh, I mean, other uh, German boats were shelling Scarborough. And uh, the, who knew what the submarines, because submarine U-boats, the German U-boats, were a fairly modern you know, invention uh, used in warfare. And zeppelins were coming over. So it was brought to the people's front doors or you know, roofs. And, um, and the, you know, the, who was to know that whether they could get submarines into here, you know, up the Humber and start attacking and landing. I mean, because even at Paul, there was lookouts there and reinforced all the way along the but the anti-German feeling was quite strong, particularly uh, against German butchers. There were like Ubels and uh, Crest and Wagner, and there were lots of local firms, just think about Isle Road, um, who had German origins, but they were truly British. And some of them Germans, you know, of, of origin, they were serving in the war. 
And, um, but then also, I think people mixed up Jewish names with the German names, and so they got stones uh, thrown through the windows. So, yeah, sadly, there was a lot of misunderstanding, and uh, so it was the businesses had to close down or change the name sometimes, you know. You know, the fishing fraternity do have a very strong matriarchy, and the women uh, keep things going. And there's another expression, you know, because the men are away for such long times, um, and during the box, box fleet fishing type period uh, that we're talking about in the Edwardian Britain <clears throat> and after the First World War, um, the men would be away for six weeks or longer. So the women had to uh, run things and they were classed as mother and father both. And so, so and in the, also you had little terraces which reinforced this setup whereby, you know, say a mother lived there and a daughter was getting married she'd have a word with the rent collector and say, oh, Mrs. Myrtle's leaving number nine. Can my daughter who's getting married next week have the keys, you know? And the landlord or rent collector would know the family from generations and say, oh, be keen to do that. And so he'd have aunties and grannies and sisters all in the same community, and that was good. The men from the Euclid ended up interned in Germany at a pre-war civilian camp in Berlin. They wrote home asking for soap, clothes and cigarette papers. A few days later, on May the 21st, H346 Sabrina was struck by a mine. Among those who died was a 15-year-old boy, Arthur Johnson. We were swallowed up home by the beast of the sea and woke again under the sycamore tree. Inquiries were often held into why trawlers strayed into restricted waters. It took place under the Defence of the Realm Act, 1914. One such incident took place on Christmas morning, 1914, when skipper George Laming came before the dock, charged with running a vessel through the Humber without a pilot. Laming told the officer he thought he knew his way through the minefield without a pilot. Laming was lucky. The Board of Trade held many inquiries into sinkings of boats. Skipper Walter Haynes of the Horatio disobeyed the Admiralty patrol signals while fishing off the East Coast. Instead of stopping, he used strong language and was fined three guineas plus costs. Ah, well, he's Mad Rylet, he's part of the Rylet family. And I, had, and I had the pleasure of interviewing the Rylets, uh, his son, Ted, who was in the Second World War, but Mad Rylet, his dad, um, he survived both World Wars and served in both World Wars. Uh, but Mad Rylet, a Gypsyville family, and uh, strong working, you know, a strong working class fishing family, and really, and he was called Mad, um, not because he was lonely, because he, he had quite a temper. And if he was angry with a young trawler man or skipper, you know, a mate or whatever, or the engineer, he would throw it, take his hat off, throw it on the ground and jump up and down on his hat. And this poor wretch or a trawler lad or whatever, be scared stiff. But what they said about Mad Rylet was, as soon as it was over, you know, he'd forgotten about it. You know, he's one of these people who had a blue his top and then forgot about it, you know, a few minutes later on. But for the poor wretch who had been told off, he maybe still living with the consequences. But no, he was, but the Germans also felt the wrath of Mad Rylet, as well as the British Admiralty, because he, he was, because it was, it's worth reinforcing the view that the trawlermen, especially the skippers, were independent, and they didn't like the discipline of the, of the Navy and the hierarchy. They weren't really, because going out in the North Sea or up to the Arctic, they were their own bosses, the independent seafarers, uh, who just made their own decisions. They didn't like being told what to do. And Mad Rylet, well, he, 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 um, he got the Croix de Grey from the French, you know, as a very high honour. Um, and a lot of people felt that for what he did at that time, uh, they should have been given the VC, but because he, he punched a British officer uh, of the Royal Navy, um, he was thrown in jail, and it may have been these four French officers who'd been rescued, who we'd rescued on a whole trawler called the Tamora that had been requisitioned. And um, he'd, he'd saved them. And it's a long story, but um, 
he just and he, he would spit at some officers as well so you know for and he classed as insubordination of a superior officer there were German, the British would come along and sweep the mine, the, the minefield clear and they sort of would go on but then Ryler when he was at Great Yarmouth Sparrow's Nest he would say to the, his officers look for one night let's not clear the mines and then when the Germans go back again with their U-boats uh, to relay them they'll get caught in their own well he used a, po a swear word uh, get caught in their own muck you know and, and get blown up by the, hoisted by their own petard if I quote Shakespeare and um, and that's what happened uh, they didn't they deliberately didn't clear that particular minefield that the Germans had laid and then maybe the Germans unwittingly came back and got killed you know blown up by their own one of their own mines and then the following day or two the wreckage was found on the coast you know sort of thing so yeah so I think he would have been seen as very daring for that kind of um, activity you know the I mean it was a hard fought battle and um, like I said at the beginning they were there from practically day one I mean I don't know how long it took for the land battles to start you know for digging trenches and doing all that <coughs> but the you know like we're saying for the fishing families they were worrying from the day war was declared and uh, so but yeah in yeah because it was uh, the British I think um, were very methodical in fighting uh, against the uh, the Germans and the, the U-boats and the Navy. Many ended up in Ruhleben, a German horse race track, which had been turned into a detainment camp. Skipper of the St Cuthbert, John Green and his crew, were captured by the Germans while fishing and spent many weeks on ships before being sent to this camp. Skipper Green kept a diary detailing it all. The crew had sailed from Grimsby on the 20th of August 1914 and returned on November the 25th, 1918. At last, the news came through that we were to be sent to a place much worse than the Hulks. One old fellow, I shall never forget, when we left the Hulks, he was laid on a bunk, too ill to get up, and should have been sent to hospital. But he was told to dress up and come with us on the dreary ride. And the only attention he received was from his comrades. It was too much for him, and he died soon after reaching our destination. When they were around um, the Shetland Islands, uh, U-boat surfaced, fired on them. Um, he was taken on the U on, onto the U-boat to be taken to Germany, and the crew were put in a lifeboat and um, set adrift, and they were never seen again. Being April, I suppose you get lots of um, storms around that area. My grandma, I know my grandma was always really upset and she didn't really talk much about it, but um, I think he had a hard time there. Uh, he was a really quiet man um, and he was a gentleman and he was a gentleman, uh, which you see by keeping 10 children. Um, but I, I don't really know much about what happened in the camp apart from the postcard we have. Grandma often spoke about him because I think he must have been a really kind person when I, I look at the card that he sent from the camp. And um, she said that he'd had quite harsh treatment and that he'd been marched for miles and miles and she said the feet were running with blood and she really was upset about the way he'd been treated there. Hmm? It must have been really terrible for him when he came back because his crew were never seen again and he was a survivor. So one can only assume that things were very difficult for him when he came back because the fishing community was a very close-knit community. And of course, he would see the families of the rest of his crew. Well, Fred Hayward was also a troll skipper and I believe during the First World War he was in the... Um, reserves and we believe he was on minesweepers. Hmm. When we did the investigation about him it said that he escaped with another man but there was later captured but we got told that he did lead the Germans a merry dance so we don't really know exactly what happened but it said that when they got caught they got put in a cell for 14 days and that's when they was fed this black bread and water. 
the man would never eat brown bread because of the black bed bread situation. He was stayed on the trawlers, he actually went to sea and that, and uh, he was on it a long time, well he, he died on a ship and he was 59 when he actually died on a trawler as well, so he did the job he loved and he died doing the job he loved. George Robinson, he, 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 he went fishing until the sort of late 1915, joined the, uh, the, the minesweeping service and he worked on what had been the Bournemouth Bell, what became HMS Bourne and most of a fair chunk of the war he spent minesweeping in the Harwich area which was one of the most heavily mined sections of the war and, and he kept a diary uh, which is quite graphic it tells you all sorts of things about what happened uh, when you read it there are, there are days of drudgery where the fish you know where the um, the, the sweeping day after day and nothing's happened and then other days of intense uh, um, um, excitement or, uh, uh, or or danger uh, where they're, 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 they're removing mines where they nearly get sunk by a mine that they hadn't noticed where ships around them are blown up uh, and where in, on occasions there are encounters with U-boats or even zeppelins. So it's quite a graphic account of a period of time through the war. And he tells it in quite a deadpan manner. Uh, and, but you can see or read the danger that's inherent in the story. It's quite something really. When I was transcribing the diary, I had my own diary alongside. I was making various entries. It was just so mundane compared with that. You know, but you just think, for all that, which one would you prefer to live through? But it, the interesting thing was he survived the war. Many around him didn't. After the war, he went back on the boxing fleets. Uh, but when the boxing fleets were finally dispersed from Hull in the 1930s, mid-1930s, he was getting all of it. He couldn't get another role, really, uh, as, as a trollman like that. So he joined the ships running supplies in for the Spanish government, fighting Franco in the Spanish Civil War and spent nearly three years doing that, which was a pretty hazardous occupation. He was on a tanker running supplies in, which was not the, uh, you know, the best of vessels to be on in that. So he spent uh, a period of that. After that, he's involved in the Battle of the Atlantic um, until he's finally literally too old almost, or too ill to go to sea. Um, so in a sense, that, that, that wartime activity of his really had an effect on him for years and years to come. We were swallowed up whole by the beast of the sea and woke again under the sycamore tree. In 1914, at the outbreak of war, Hull was handling 150,000 tonnes of fish a year. The Humber ports were the largest in the country and much development had taken place. Technological advances saw fishmongers and wholesalers spring up in both areas. Fried fish was popular, with or without chips. After the war in 1919, there were 243 fried fish sellers in Hull. Fishing and the popular chippy both needed each other. In the 1840s and early 1850s, much of the national railway network that we now take for granted was laid out. And what railways did for the first time was they provided fast and reliable access in land, quick access. And this suited particularly a perishable commodity like fish. It overnight made fish an article of cheap mass consumption. It took a while to set up all the networks, the trading networks, but fish was very profitable. And when you think that inland, thanks to the Industrial Revolution, the industrial towns were growing massively, quickly, and they needed a cheap and nutritious form of food, and fish provided that. And so between 1840 and, say, 1860, much of the National Railway Network was created, uh, and also a national trade in fresh fish was was uh, created and of course within that sort of period 1850 to 1870 some genius and we don't know who no matter what the you know the the, the celebrity chefs on tv tell you some genius put fish with chips 
and a national institution was formed. You know, you go anywhere, go in an old fish and chip shop and look at where many of the ranges are. You'll see them places like, you know, um, the, the, the firms were in, in places like Halifax or they were in places like Oldham or Birmingham. These were just the very centres where, you know, fish was making a mark in the later 19th century. And of course, on the back of that, trawling proved an admirable way for taking uh, fish, the sort of fish that could be sold cheaply and in large amounts in land. Fishing continued throughout the First World War and many fell prey to the U-boats. When war broke out, many vessels were grounded. Trade ground to a halt and supplies of fish dried up. Many thought they'd be unemployed. A lot of money could be made. If you were able to continue fishing, if you were able to get a crew, uh, right, uh, and if you were sunk, then you could actually make an incredible amount of money. This was a time when lots of money was made by not only the owners, but also the f you know, skippers and various fishermen themselves if they continued fishing. But of course, that was something we not called up by the you know to, to, to serve in the forces as course as happens later in the war or did we did you have a vessel to go on and where would you get your crews from and you find that a lot of crews are either the the very old or the very young uh, uh, these are the people who are operating the vessels in the later stages of the war there's one example given I've never ever traced the individual ship but it was quoted after the war that on one ship at least it was crewed by a crew that were largely over the age of 70 or eight, even 80. So you, you can imagine the difference. The other way that the war changed the fishing industry and because, because the inshore fishing became much more important for a period of time again uh, and, and inshore fishing was transformed during the war because prior to the war most vessels in the inshore fishery were worked by either sail or by oars. But increasingly during the war, the internal combustion engine was used. Uh, and of course, if you look at inshore fishing today, it's all motor-powered vessels. And of course, it was the First World War that really kicked all that off. Throughout the war, the Admiralty had been busily taking on vessels and replacing them when needed. They thought they'd struck a balance between the minesweepers and the fishing fleet. They failed dismally. From 1,900 vessels in 1914 to fewer than 1,400 requisitioned in 1917, those left fishing had been destroyed by the enemy or the sea. This extreme shortage of trawlers saw the flow of fish to the table diminish and the price of fish rise. Pre-war trawlers could easily make a profit of five to seven thousand pounds per annum. By late 1916, it had risen to 30 to 40 thousand pounds per annum. For the housewife, it was becoming unaffordable, and the government weren't happy about it either. What did fishermen do? What did the fishing industry do in the Great War? There are several different dimensions to this. First of all, um, a large number of vessels were taken up for mine sweeping, and enormous numbers that we look at. Other vessels were taken up and put onto anti-submarine patrol and similar work like that. The, the Viola is a good example of that, that type of craft. Uh, and others remained fishing. And, of course, to remain fishing was extremely important because you also had to try to maintain the beleaguered nation's fish supply. So all three. But whichever role you were playing, you were working out in hostile territories. You were working on the front line. Uh, and that was the, the really difficult thing. So whereas you had all the normal hazards of fishermen fishing at sea, and we know how dangerous an occupation that was, you've now got the additional dimension of the enemy and the fact that the enemy will be trying to remove you uh, either as a source of food or as a source of uh, a mine removal and and so we realize this is an extremely difficult and dangerous job and places like Grimsby and Hull their fishermen were very much on the front line with this. Unarmed and unescorted the fishing industry was paying a heavy price if nothing was done the fishing industry would cease to exist a few days before Good Friday 1916, the hull trawler Elf King landed a catch worth £3,670, giving the skipper a wage of £300, making him a rich man. In May 1917, a war order requisitioned all remaining trawlers, which were placed in the fisheries reserve. All sorts of people played that crucial role on, 
on the Q ship. Uh, and, and it was a, a, a crucial role, but as I said, a controversial role. But much of the war at sea became quite controversial. The war at sea, in many respects, was a very modern war because it was a war of, of, of sort of, of, of performance indicators and targets. When the Germans unleashed unlimited submarine warfare, uh, in 1917, they reckoned if they sunk a certain number of vessels in a certain period of time, Britain would be brought to its needs. Well, to misquote it is really, there are lies, damn lies, performance indicators and targets. Uh, and of course, these didn't work. You know, the British found other ways around it. Uh, they, they were able to save some of the vessels, um, salvage them. That's another important role, the role that salvage people played in the war. In other cases, yeah, they were able to um, to, to persuade um, neutral countries to charter more vessels in. They were able to turn vessels around more quickly. So there are all sorts of ways in which the British government got round uh, the, the the crisis, uh, uh, which was brought on by the uh, the sinking of vessels. The trawlers were given guns and flew the white ensign. In order to offer better protection, they had to fish in groups of twenty with four to five armed trawlers to protect them. Over the war, some 672 trawlers were sunk with a loss of 416 lives through enemy action. After the war, the mine-sweeping trawlers went back to their old way of life. With over a quarter of a million mines laid by the Germans, it wasn't long after the armistice had been signed that mines still posed a problem for those on the East Coast and continued to do so right up until the 1970s. Not every, you wouldn't catch one every day, but you know it was quite a regular occurrence to fish mines up. Well, there's not a lot you can do really. Just be very, very careful and try try and get it back over the back over the side again. And all of the places we've grown tired of. Was it successful? After the war. Admiral Beatty visited Grimsby and told the crowd, The Royal Navy saved the nation, but the fishermen saved the Navy. I think that's a, a very good statement, really. And it's one of those things that we, 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 we hear. It, it, the role of fishermen nowadays tends in the war tends to be either forgotten or brushed off. But if you look back to the early recommendations on this, you'll see that... That, that quite often people are pre were appreciative of the time of the role that fishermen played. And they did play a crucial role because they, initially when the war started and the Grand Fleet arrived at Scarpa, uh, the, 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 the fleet itself had to be protected. Right? And the vessels that were doing boom duties were fishing vessels. They were guarding the entrance. They were obviously out there um, mine sweeping. Uh, when the fleet went out on a big patrol, it took fast sweepers with them, destroyers, etc. But the day-to-day -day work of keeping the sea lanes clear was very much the war of them. Because, as I said, the emphasis always tends to be on dreadnoughts, on Jutland, that sort of thing. But day after day, week after week, month after month, the battle on the maritime front line was being fought against mines and U-boats, and it was fishing vessels and fishing crews from all around the British Isles that were on that maritime front line. And that role deserves to be recognised much more strongly than the conventional picture that we get of the war at sea. City below, 